Being a good project manager in engineering is easy. All you have to do is manage the scope, schedule, and budget effectively. That's what people say all the time. However, they fail to tell you what the scope, schedule, and budget are, right? They don't define them, especially for younger professionals or soon to be PMs. And they rarely talk about the relationship between these three critical components of project management and how they really drive client satisfaction overall. So in this week's video, I have with me Mike Lozanoff, project management extraordinaire, and we're going to dive into scope, schedule, budget, and how you can manage these three effectively and what it can do for you and your firm. Let's jump right in. All right, welcome to the first inaugural episode of the Engineering Project Management Podcast. We're excited to have my guest with me for today, Mike Lozanoff. Mike is the owner at Lozanoff Consulting Services. He's also one of our PM instructors at EMI. Mike, welcome to the Engineering Project Management Podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be with you again. Excited to have Mike here. Mike was on our Civil Engineering Podcast recently and talked about one aspect of project management, kind of finance and write-offs. And that episode really took off. So we're thrilled to have him back to help us kick this one off. And Mike, to get us going here, why don't you tell our listeners mm -hmm. a little bit about yourself and, and your career journey and really your experience with project management? Sure. Um, so I've been in the AEC industry, architecture, engineering, construction industry for a bit over 25 years now. Um, I am a professional engineer. And so as most engineers, I started off at a very technical nature doing design. Um, I had an opportunity to get involved in some survey work and some other field work from a construction observation standpoint. So as a technical person, I really enjoyed those opportunities that kind of formed me as a, as a technical person. And to that end, um, I, you know, I really enjoyed design. And I remember um, a time early in my career that um, I was working on a project um, probably three, maybe four years in. And I think I was getting ready to take my PE license. And um, we were doing a residential subdivision. I remember this project and I had done a couple of these before. And um, I just remember that I, I wanted to take everything that I had learned. Um, I'm getting ready to take the PE exam like this. I'm going to take this. This is going to be the best residential subdivision that I've ever designed. So I spent time, lots of time getting into the design looking at it, revising it, trying to come up with the perfect design. And I remember when I got done, I was really proud and I submitted it to my boss at the time who um, he reviewed everything. He was the licensed engineer, so he had to review everything. So about a week or so later, he comes back to me and says, hey, Mike, I want to talk to you about this project. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that'd be great. I, I, you know, what did you think? He said, I, I thought the design was, was really good. But I noticed it took you around three weeks to do that project. And I said, uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Yeah. And he goes, well, I had only budgeted for you to work on that for two weeks. And why did it take? I'm just curious of why it took so long. I was like dumbfounded. I didn't even know what he was talking about. I was, I, I was so taken aback. I was like, what do you mean you budgeted two weeks? Well, first of all, he never told me that he budgeted two weeks to, that it would take on this. Right. So I'm just designing away, redesigning, you know, trying to create the Taj Mahal of, you know, residential subdivisions. So I really had no idea. Um, and that's when it, like, the light bulb went on. It's like, so this is how we get paid. Like, this is, I just, I just assumed, I didn't even know what projects cost. I just was, I thought my job was just to design away and design the most perfect thing. So that really sparked my interest. And, you know, soon after that, I eventually left that company and went to a much larger company, and through the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to work for very small, very large, and some decently medium-sized companies. And, you know, I kind of moved up through the ranks of becoming a project manager. I trained under another project manager. I was fortunate enough in my career to be able to do that. And then from then on, I, you know, took on different projects, different challenges, more complexity, larger projects, eventually managing programs, and then kind of just, you know, took that and springboarded through my career between managing groups, then, you know, regional manager, group manager, director, et cetera, serving at kind of some of the highest levels in organizations, um, which was very great, you know, and I look at that and, you know, project management kind of was the springboard 
for me to do all of that um, because it was really led to that career path, which right now, you know, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I decided that, you know, I wanted an opportunity to step out on my own and take all that I have learned. And I was fortunate enough in my career to learn a ton of different things. And I wanted to help other companies, uh, whether they be architects, engineers, construction folks, contractors, it's all relatable in this industry and, and beyond and take what I've learned in those and help those companies in any way that I can. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I do a lot of different things, project management and helping them with their project management practices, um, their systems, et cetera, is a big part because it, a lot of what we all do is projects. That's what we do. And that's how we make our money. So it starts with how effective we manage those projects is how much more money we're going to make. But oftentimes yeah. as you dig into that, it, it's led into operational uh, aspects, um, changing different systems, uh, enhancing different things here and there, organizational development, because in project management, there's an aspect of those pieces as well. And, you know, even some strategic and, and business development planning, lots of different things. So I've, I've had a great fortunate career to do a lot of those things. And so that's what I get to do. And um, that's what I help other companies with. And, you know, it's a lot of different variety and you know, honestly, I love every minute of it. So, but it all, to me, I wouldn't have or be where I was without project management or an interest in that because everything that I've described beyond that, the building block started with project management. Yeah, that's great. And that's a point I want to touch on from what Mike said is that Mike's had a lot of opportunities in his career. He's been able to do a lot of things, but if you boil it all down, a lot of it is because he focused on project management and developed those skill sets. And it's yeah. interesting to hear him say that a lot of the quote unquote problems or issues or challenges that companies deal with in the engineering world can be boiled back down to project management, which is why for you in your career, if you focus on project management skills, I believe the sky is the limit for you in your career. And that's one of the reasons yeah. that we started this podcast, because if we can help engineering professionals upskill in project management, then you're going to have more opportunities and getting to that. When you hear about project management, you will typically hear people say three things, scope, schedule, and budget. If you want to be a good project manager, you got to manage scope, schedule, and budget. And so to kind of kick the podcast off, we're going to focus on an overview of scope, schedule, and budget in today's episode. And we're going to talk about with Mike, we're going to define them all, but we're going to talk about the relationship between those three and how managing them effectively is so important. So with that, Let's start it off with scope, Mike. Why don't you describe for our listeners, what is project scope? You know, when I think of scope, I think simply it just defines and sets the expectations for not only your client, but your project team of what exactly you're contracted to do and what you're not contracted to do. Um, and I guess, let me use kind of two examples that I think are pretty relatable to most folks in our industry, which is let's talk about public work and private work and how maybe those scopes are kind of used in that sense. So a lot of times in private work, in my experience of doing that, we're usually given our scopes via an RFP, a request for proposal, right, from our clients. They have determined the project that they need done, and they've done their best job to um, create a level playing field amongst their bidders and telling you what they're hoping or what they're looking for you to do. So they're creating those scopes, right? And so as a project manager, um, our job in terms of writing scopes is done, right? They've done that job for us. Um, how What I'll say though to that is um, just because the client has provided that scope to us, it doesn't mean that it's perfect, right? It came from somebody in the industry or maybe even not and how they created that. And it's our job still to manage that project, right? So if we are afforded that or fortunate enough to win that job and now we have to manage to that. So as product managers, it is our job and right there at the RFP stage to really fully understand that scope. Is it understandable? Is it vague? Is it amb ambiguous? Um, and if it is, we got to want to respond to that RFP. FP, right? We want to make sure that we're clearing up any of those um, things that are just left, you know, kind of open-ended. A um, couple of different reasons. Number one, again, if we're fortunate enough to win the job, 
that's our contract. So we're held to do and perform that scope. I think the second piece is it does in a bidding situation, my opinion, a lot of times help level the playing field because you may interpret that scope one way and I may interpret it a, a, a totally different way, especially if it's open-ended, right? And therefore our bids may not be exactly the same. So that just kind of goes in a little bit of detail of like when I think about public scopes, I mean, they're written kind of for you. Mm -hmm. On the private side, we're usually dealing with an owner or a developer or whatever, but our client tends to want to, they're looking to either build something or build and permit something, right? And they come to us as the consultant or the expert, right? Um, because we know what it takes to build and permit that, you know, whatever it is that they're looking for. So they basically give us some loose parameters of what they're looking for. And it's our job to put that contract together and put those scopes together in a kind of a logical order, right? So as PMs, it's our job to write those scopes. Um, and when we're doing that, and to be honest, you know, I've seen a lot of scopes over the years. And I think just a couple of key points that I try to, you know, uh, hammer home with my project managers is, let's remember to keep those scopes clear and concise, right? We don't want these scopes to ramble on filled with so much technical jargon that our clients can't really understand. Heck, most of our staff probably doesn't understand, right? We're in an industry of acronyms, right? We use an acronym for almost everything, but we assume everybody just knows what that is, right? So spell out what we need to spell out and don't spell out what, what we don't, right? Um, don't leave anything vague. Vague is left for it's the same reason as I just said in a public, right? Vague is left for interpretation. And our clients and our team may interpret it one way and we might interpret another way. So let's button those things up. I think the other thing that we need to remember is they should be easily understood, like I said. But we have a job to do as project managers is I think something that a lot of project managers don't think about is we're always managing risk, right? That's not, that's comes inherent with managing those projects. So our scopes help protect us from risk. So in that end, we need to make sure that it's very clear what we're gonna do and what we're not gonna do. Now, I would say conversely with that, I have worked with some project managers that get so hung up on the things that we're not going to do because they're worried about, you know, risk so much that I've had a couple that, We've written like two lines of what we're going to do and then, you know, 50 line items of the things that we're not. And I would go back to them and said, well, we did a great job of telling the client what we're not going to do, but I'm still not really clear of what we are going to do for them. So let's not lose the forest through the trees here of what we're going to do. And I think the last item that I try to do is make sure we don't leave anything open ended. What I mean by that is think of things that are hard to define up front, things like how many meetings we're going to attend, how about how many RFIs we're going to respond to, or how many sites visits are we going to go to. So if we can put those parameters around, we want to. Um, if you're still not sure, um, then I, you know, I don't want to get into billing terms, but basically, you know, things that we can't really define, we should make those things as time and materials because it's undefined. Um, you know, especially when we're dealing with those kind of ambiguous or, or really undefined areas. You know, I'm working with a client right now that they're involved in a lot of public work and contractors are routinely submit RFIs. Well, they're working with this one contractor and they've been doing this for years. So they kind of have an idea of like how many RFIs are going to take for each job, right? Within five or 10. So they put in there, they will respond to all, all RFIs. Well, the particular contractor in this case is submitted like, I think they're on their 50th or maybe higher RFI. And it's just taken them a long time to do. But if you go back and read their contract, it says, I'll respond to all, we will respond to all RFIs. They're on the hook for that. They want to go back and get more money from the client. And maybe because of their relationship, they can, they can explain that. But in terms of your contract, you're kind of locked in. So, I mean, I think that's really, when you think about scope, I mean, that's a, it's a huge important aspect of what you got to, you know, take into consideration there. Absolutely. And, and on that last point, with that company, for example, they could have spelled out in the scope, we will respond to up to 25 RFIs right. and offer RFIs. So when they got to that 10, they could then go to the client and say, hey, we completed 10 as per the contract. If you'd like us to review to more, we can give you a lump sum fee for another 10, or we can do hourly as many or, as you can, this type of thing. So, you know, you're putting the ball back in your court versus having it in theirs. Exactly. And like, like earlier, if there's anything that's vague, like, 
respond to all RFIs, which in a sense is vague because all is can be, you know, a hundred or can be 10. That's problematic. So a couple of things I want to just reinforce on what Mike said, because I know some of you may be really new in terms of project management, getting it back to the public and private side of things, right? So some of you may work in the private world, meaning that your clients are private entities. They're maybe doing redevelopment projects, building a new commercial building, you know, whatever the case may be. And they want you to deliver X, right? And there are different ways mm -hmm. you could deliver X. So you kind of have to go back and forth with them and figure out what that is. Whereas if you're working on the public side of things, and let's say you're doing work for an agency or a DOT, right? Oftentimes they'll put out a request for a proposal with a very well-defined scope that everybody has to bid on. So you're not really going to be going back and forth with them trying to figure out what the scope is because it's given to you. And so that's important. And when you think about the scope, if you want to use kind of an analogy for it, you know, someone might say, hey, I want you to build me a house. Okay, so the deliverables build a house, but what kind of house? How many floors is the house? What's the exterior? Right. What's the interior look like? So going back to what Mike was saying in terms of drilling down on what that scope is, you have to really understand the details of what's going to go into that house for you to be able to effectively prepare a scope and then effectively price it and do a schedule, which we're going to talk about next, right? So, you know, it's it's important that you have a big picture of what you want to accomplish, but you also need to understand the entire scope of work that it's going to take to be able to do that. I mean, another example I can give you is, let's say someone comes to an artist and says, hey, I want you to paint me a painting. Okay, you want to paint a painting, that's fine. But a painting could be one stroke of paint on a canvas, or you could work on it for you know three months, right? So right. a scope of work can really help you to understand how much is going to go into a project. And I guess, Mike, a simple follow-up question to that is, why is having a clear scope of work so important to project management? Well, I look at the, I mean, it all starts with scope, right? I mean, it's really, I look at that as like the building block of your project. So it's, I can't really tell you how long something is really going to take me to do or how much it's going to cost if I don't really know what I'm doing. So I got to understand, you know, I start with the scope and, you know, it, it provides a couple of different things too with that. So it, it gives me that how and, and how much, but it also, again, going back, it sets those boundaries and expectations with your client and your project team of what we're contract to do and what we're not. Um, and it's important that your con, you know, your client understand those boundaries as well as your team, because, you know, as a project manager, we're involved in a lot and, you know, it's important that we get our teams involved in what's within our scopes and educating them so they can help identify when we're out of scope, um, or there's an, an ask that we need to do above and beyond. Right. And we all know, you know, well, maybe for the young project managers who haven't got too far into it. Working out of scope is just a, a big no-no for lots of different reasons. And that's probably a whole nother podcast in itself. I think that's a whole other series <laughs> of episodes, quite frankly, which is called scope creep for those of you that haven't dealt with that yet. But that's basically you start to get outside of that scope or your team members who aren't aware of that scope of work are working outside of the scope. And mm -hmm. then you're basically working on things that you're not getting paid for, which is kind of the worst possible thing that can happen in the world of project management. So we will cover that in another episode. But now moving on to the next step in this kind of scope schedule budget is the schedule. So okay. Mike, just talk about at a high level, kind of the importance of a good schedule on a project and how, again, that's intertwined with what we just talked about, your scope. Well, this is again, I mean, so as project managers and for your listeners, I'm sure we have project managers that are going to listen to this that manage a wide variety of different projects, probably different size and scale, right? So there's not really one perfect tool out there that I can say, this is what you should use and you should use this for every project because a project that is a quick turn project, let's say you know a week or even a few days, the schedule you create for that is going to look and should look far different than a schedule that might go a year or more, have several complexities, different interdependencies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I can't use the same tool to be able to do that. Um, if your company provides you a tool that they insist that you use, obviously you're gonna need to use that. Um, and then hopefully you'll be able to adapt that to meet your project needs. Um, my recommendation is for every project manager, find a schedule tool that's gonna work for them. Um, the whole idea of the schedule is that we're keeping track of how things are going 
and moving things forward, right? Um, we don't want to be short-sighted and say, okay, well, I know it's a big project, but I think a schedule is, I started this date and I submitted or ended this date. That's a schedule. Well, I guess in basic terms, you could call that a schedule. It's not really a, a useful schedule, right? But also I think we wanna make sure that our schedules aren't so detailed. And I've seen some project managers like task out kind of goes back to the scope, right? We have a lot of different tasks that we do. Let's go back to your building the house example, right? There's a lot of elements that go into building a house. You don't just boom, there's the house, right? So sometimes we wanna detail all of those pieces out. And so we try to schedule each and every little thing and then becoming managing the schedule becomes all too consuming. And we focus too much on managing that schedule and its intricacies, and we kind of lose you know, the bigger picture of the whole project. So find something that's gonna work for you. Um, key milestones are a must. Um, and then how much other additional detail do you need to be able to effectively manage? Um, think of those interdependencies. And what do I mean by an interdependency is task A has to be completed before task B can begin. Right. So those are things that you can't start B, even though you have B at a different date, it can't start until A is finished. So that's, you know, what I'm talking about when I think when you look at schedule, it's got to work for you as the project manager. Um, creating a schedule because somebody tells you to isn't, you know, isn't going to be helpful. Right. Um, or, so or the client says, I need it done by client, January right. 1st. Well, Jen, just because they need it done by January 1st doesn't mean that it's actually feasible. That, right. That can you do that? And having a schedule that you can actually go back to them versus just going, I can't meet that. Right. You, the client the client doesn't want to hear that. But if you can educate them and say, let me show you, I, I've done my best to schedule this and this, and this is how long these things take. And I, no matter how many people you put on it, you're not going to get it done in that period of time. And, you know, again, whole nother podcast, but just throwing tons of people out of project just because you're running behind schedule is never a good thing either. Yeah, for sure. And one thing I'll say to follow up on that is, you know, we're talking about, of course, the interrelation today between scope, schedule, budget, kind of overview on what they are. So if you can identify a clear scope of work, which is the goal for every project manager, you have a list of tasks, essentially, that you could develop off of that. And that's going to be the basis of your schedule. Because I know some of you might be thinking, especially if you're a newer project manager, you know, how do I actually estimate the time that it's going to take to figure to right. complete some of these really complex engineering projects that I'm working on? Well, you have a good scope. The scope helps you break down the tasks and the tasks can be, can be laid out into a schedule. And then you can logically put the amount of time associated with each task and kind of add them up based on interdependencies. Like Mike said, for example, you can't start framing the house before the foundation is poured and in place, right? So, all that builds on each other. And the one thing that I'll say about schedule, and we're not going to go into it further today because you know that's, again, another episode. But one of the places where I see people get caught up on scheduling is the difference between effort and duration. And I'll just briefly mention that, right? The effort is about how much time it takes someone to do a task. So I might ask Mike on my team, hey, Mike, how long is it going to take you to draw the CAD drawing for this project? And Mike's going to say, well, it's going to take me about 30 hours for this project. Okay, great. Well, I can't just go to my schedule and put 30 hours because he's not going to sit there in one week and work 30 hours in a row. He may work. He may say, hey, it's going to take me 30 hours, but I can only do 10 hours a week for the next three weeks. So the actual duration on my schedule has to be shown as three weeks, even though the hours maybe for a budget, which we're going to get to next, is 30 hours. So that's just a little thing yeah. to be aware of with scheduling. It's not as easy as like, hey, it's three hours here, five hours here, put them together. You got eight hours and throw it on your schedule. So Again, we'll get into that when we start covering scheduling in more detail in some of our episodes. But again, high level, you got your scope. I'm going to take those tasks that you developed through the scope, put them into a schedule, which is really important because your client wants to know when their project is going to be done, right? So as a PM, you need to be able to you know, give them an idea of when that's going to happen. And then, of course, that takes us to our third leg of the so-called three-legged stool, which is project budget. So, mm. Mike, we've got the scope. We got we can get a good idea of how long it's going to take, but also another critical component of the scope is, you know, being able to forecast what a budget's going to look like. What's a cost going to look like for a client? So talk about, you know, developing a project budget or a cost estimate. People call it different things based on the scope. 
So again, let's go back to that example we did a little bit earlier about the, the house example. So how long does it take us to do these things? So the scope defines exactly what we're going to do. And at that point, we should know how long those items are going to take. So how long will it take us to do the foundation, right? In our industry, no matter where we're working, um, we're a professional services industry. And basically how we build all of our fee is... We each of us have a bill rate and we take that times the amount of hours it's going to take us to complete that task. So as we're kind of building a budget, you kind of build it and we a lot of times we'll use the terminology man hour estimate. What does that mean? It's well, OK, how many hours times the cost uh, times our bill rate is the cost of that aspect. And so you kind of build things from there. If you've broken everything down by task, you kind of build your budget the same way. Let's start with that aspect and build our budget for each task. And then as you get through and you summate all of the tasks involved, you kind of end up with your overall project budget. Uh, again, it's all based on time that we think or plan it's going to take to get that aspect done. Yeah, that's it's it's it. And and that kind of leads into my next question of, you know, people do constantly refer to scope schedule budget as project management. We know it goes deeper than that, but at that level, just talk for a minute, Mike, about the interrelationship between scope schedule budget and why as a project manager, you really need to, you know, keep an eye on all of them, not just one. Yeah. So I, I think, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it starts with scope, right? I mean, again, that's the building block for everything that we do. So we have to understand the, the work that is done. And by doing so, we understand how long those aspects are going to take. That in turn builds the budget. And then that in turn, because how long it's going to take, we can then plan a schedule once we see everything kind of put together. So let's go uh, just a couple examples. Let's say if I, I'm a project manager and I heard your message. I'm going to concentrate on scope and I'm going to pay attention. Scope is the biggest thing. That's what I'm taking away from this podcast. I need to focus on scope. So if I'm only focused on scope and I'm, I'm worried, they, they mentioned, don't go out of scope. So I got to make sure that I'm staying within scope. If you're making sure that that's all you're doing, um, you're not really keeping an eye on probably the overall schedule. How long is this going to take? If I only look at, let's go back to my example, right? I thought I did the best design. I was within the scope. I designed the heck out of that thing, but I went way too long. I had no idea. No one told me that there was a budget associated with that, right? And how many hours. So you can lose, you know, those other two elements very quickly. Um, let's look at budget. If I was only worried about budget, uh, and I know some project managers that, I mean, it's hammered into them. You've got to manage your budget and they kind of freak out about that. So they're really focused on budget and they're taking their eye off of, are we staying within the scope? Are we growing beyond that? We're spending more dollars, but we don't know why. I'm just looking at our budget every day and I'm seeing what's being spent, right? And I don't know if we're meeting the schedule or not. Um, what if I'm thinking based on the budget, we've spent 50% of the fee. We're probably 50% of the way on the project. You can't make that assumption. I understand why you might make that assumption, but you got to go and make sure that you're doing the work that you're supposed to. And is it as far as long in that schedule as that, that you thought? And then I think if you just only look at schedule, you're missing the other two elements, right? I'm not really understanding. I see that we're hitting this, but what if we're not hitting the budget? You know, well, let's go back to that other point where you, you were talking before in the duration I told you that I wasn't going to be able to work on it for three days or four days in a row, but my schedule freed up and I was able to do that. And actually, because of that, you planned that I was going to get done in two weeks. Well, my schedule totally freed up and I did get done in two weeks. Unfortunately, I worked straight for two weeks, right? If I'm only looking at that schedule, I'm missing those pieces. I think that's why they call it the three-legged school, because if you look at only one of them, right those other two are going to break and you're going to fall down. So it's, you got to keep your eye on the prize of all, all three elements. Yeah. And I'll throw another curveball in here. Let's say you're working on a project, a bridge reconstruction and the mayor calls your office and says, Hey, by the way, we got to, we got to finish this project two weeks earlier. Cause you know, we're kicking it off. We have a ribbon cutting, right? Yeah. Now you just shorten your schedule. <laughs> 
but the scope is still the same, right? So you've got to, then you've got to make other um, maneuvers. And so it's, it's, that's why project management to me is really exciting because there's a lot involved in it. I understand it could also be very stressful, but you can see why we're going to have plenty of topics to cover throughout this podcast, because we can go down a lot of different roads in project management. But at the very end of the day, the goal for the episode here today was to just define what scope, schedule, and budget are, and then talk about the interdependence between them. And really, one thing that I'll say here is, to Mike's point, you do absolutely have to keep an eye on all of them. Now, we didn't give you the formula for doing that today. Again, we'll be getting into that as we progress through the podcast. But just to give you a couple of ideas, having a dynamic schedule, especially on larger projects where you're using some kind of program and if changes happen, you can more easily update that schedule to get, you know, be able to forecast things. That's one thing that's very bene- that's mm-hmm. very beneficial. Having the right tracking software in terms of finance so that you can run reports on your projects and see how, how far your budgets are down, right? That's important. And then there's also something that I'll mention it, but won't get into it is to earn value where Mike alluded to it before. If you've used up 50% of your budget, that doesn't mean you're 50% done. You have to actually figure out if the work that you've done is actually 50% of the work that needs to be done. So there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. We're not going to go down those roads today. The idea for today's episode was to give you an overview of scope, schedule, budget, why everybody says those three things when it comes to project management and why they are a three-legged stool. And we like to say at EMI that client satisfaction sits on the top of that stool, right? So mm-hmm. if one leg goes a little shorter than the other. Project's not going to be managed effectively. Client won't be happy. And really in consulting, that's what we care about, right? We want to make sure the clients are happy and we want to create projects that are uh, you know, great for the community and and for the safety and well-being of citizens. So with that, we're going to take a quick break. I am going to come back. We're not done yet with Mike, and we're going to ask him for his kind of biggest PM pitfall that he's seen in his time in Project Management. All right, we're back with Mike Lozanoff, owner at Lozanoff Consulting Services. Mike is also one of our PM instructors at EMI. We hope that we've given you a good overview of scope, schedule, budget, and the importance of managing the three of them. However, in this segment, this is our PM pitfall segment of the podcast where we ask our our guests, Mike, what's the biggest PM pitfall that you've identified and how would you recommend overcoming it or avoiding it for those PMs out there? I mean, I've worked with a lot of PMs over my course of career. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest pitfalls that I see is project managers focusing a bit too much on the technical aspects and trying to get that transition to understanding now you're the project, you're the manager of those. Um, it's fully understandable. We came from a technical background, right? And, and that's how we came up through the ranks. And that's what we're good at. That's what we know. And a lot of us aren't trained on these other aspects. Um, Again, you know, some people have been thrown into project management. I need you to manage scope, schedule, budget. And they're like, I I don't even know what that means. But they're excellent at managing their craft of of the technical aspect. And I think I see a lot of that. And some of them don't even want to give it up. They just like doing those technical pieces. I, I think the project managers who I know struggle the most they just they don't value those they're not reviewing their their budgets they're not reviewing schedule they look at these things as kind of a administrative tasks like i don't know why that they're important to them the biggest importance is a quality project and yes as a project manager you still got to deliver a quality project that doesn't go away you don't get absolved from that anymore these are things that are added on and it takes a unique person to be able to actually carry those you know, those through Um, the people that look at those things. And I know, you know, we're, as your podcast kind of continues, we're going to give a lot of people a lot more tools and a lot more understanding of how you manage these things, scope, schedule, and budget a little bit differently or, or more effectively. Right. But um, the people that do that on a regular basis have had far much more success on the outcomes of their projects than folks that just, don't like it, or they're just not comfortable with it, or maybe they just don't, you know, they're unsure of themselves in that aspect. And so they prioritize that much less. 
And I call that like the hope and pray method. Like at the end, we do the project and okay, how did we come out scope, schedule and budget? I hope good because I wasn't really paying attention to that. But look at this great product that I designed, right? So I think that's the biggest pitfall is you got to, how do you transition from technical person to project manager? And, and what do you need? What are the skills that you need to be able to do that? And you got to work at them. Uh, it just doesn't come, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, one of the, you know, when we do PM training in our first session, we talk about the transition from a technical professional to a project manager. And I think the biggest difference is that you have to start to think about your projects as a business. You know, one of our mm -hmm. other instructors, Ann Tomalavage, likes to say, you're the CEO of your projects at that point. And I think that's a good way to that's, put that's it. That's a good point. Yeah. Right? You have to right? think of it that way because that's not what we think of. I and mean, what I can tell you right now, for those of you listening, is if you struggle with this, you're 100% normal because, yeah, right. <laughs> because as engineers, when we start our career, we are told to calculations, run reports. Um, you know, this is oh, what, yeah. this is what you're meant to focus on. This is what our brains are analytically trained from undergraduate, right. In, into the beginning of our careers. So when all of a sudden one day somebody says, Hey, now you're responsible for managing the project. So forget the technical stuff. Let someone else do that. You focus on the scope, schedule, budget. You're like, I don't eat. That's not comfortable for me. It's not, I built right. up these habits of doing this forever. So now I'm uncomfortable. So it's okay. But there is a transition that you'll have to go through to become a successful project manager. And we hope that mm -hmm. your firm will help you with that. A lot of times when we get called into a company to, to develop a PM program, we interview project managers. And unfortunately, a lot of times what we hear was, I kind of fell into project management, right? Because they needed a project manager, but I was never really given the skills or tools to be to manage the scope, schedule, budget, and effectively. And so, you know, it's all about education. However, just know that if you're uncomfortable, if you're stuck in the technical stuff, like we're explaining, it is normal and you're going to have to step back. If your company's not helping you, you're going to have to learn about these things like scope, schedule, and budget. And you can find things online. You can read up information probably from PMI and things of that nature. But there are ways that you can learn those skills and you can become an effective project manager. And if you stick with us and subscribe to the podcast, we're going to dive into a lot of these different topics throughout the remainder of this podcast. We're going to have all different guests on, I'm sure. In fact, I know for a fact we'll have Mike on several times because Mike's got expertise in all different levels of project management. But it's about it's something you got to work at project management, you know. It's, yeah. it's it's so variable on so many different projects and so many different things can happen, which to me is why it's exciting. Um, but it is something that you just have to learn at and manage. And we hope that through this podcast, we can help you to do that. So Mike, I want to thank you for being our first guest on the engineering project management podcast. I really appreciate yeah. it. And uh, you know, I know the information that you shared here is going to help our listeners and we're excited to have you back in the future to dive into some deeper topics. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Scope, schedule, and budget are critical to effective project management, but you need to understand what they are and how they're intertwined. And I hope we help you to understand that today. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis, so please consider subscribing to our channel here so we can help you become the best manager and best leader that you can be. And I'll see you next week.